Hey guys, it's Sandro here, and welcome to part two and the paint correction stage on this brand new 2020 Ford Mustang. In part one, I went through the pre-inspection, wash, decontamination and drying steps, and I'll jump straight into part two by giving the vehicle a vital IPA wipe down. Now basically, an IPA panel wipe product is an isopropyl alcohol dilution mix that's used in this step to remove things like detergent or chemical residue, as well as any minor streaks, dust and dirt that will be left over after a decontamination process. This product should be liberally sprayed on panel by panel, wiped over and into each panel with a first microfiber cloth and then buffed off streak free with a second cloth. It should be used over the entire surface of the vehicle, including all the glass, trims and door jams. And if done right, it should take you a good half hour to do it properly. Unlike other cleaners that leave their own residue behind, an IPA product is mostly self-leveling and evaporating, so it won't leave any residue of its own behind. And you have to remember that your goal for preparing the paint is to have it as clean and bare as possible before the paint correction process, as anything you haven't removed prior to this will negatively affect the next polishing stage. Think of it this way, you wouldn't open up your car polish bottle and add a few drops of car wash detergent and then a few drops of other chemicals such as iron, tar removers and degreasers and mix in a bit of dust, dirt and grime because it's going to change the way that polish behaves and not in a good way. So if you don't spend the time to thoroughly collect that thin layer of remaining residue dust and surface dirt, you're basically just adding it and mixing it with your car polish as you begin the paint correction stage. Next is measuring the existing paint and trying to estimate the clear coat thickness. Now if you're polishing a new car with new paint that's never been compounded or polished and only has very minor defects, it's really not that vital to measure the paint as new paint should be safe to polish especially if you're just addressing minor defects. But it's also a great way to document the paint's thickness straight from the factory and in the off chance that there is something a little off you should be able to catch it and bring it to light. Now it's best to take multiple readings on every panel and basically just average those readings out to get an overall average paint thickness. On this 2020 Ford Mustang the average reading was about 125 microns or so which is pretty much an average OEM paint thickness by today's standards. And it's really not uncommon to have a variation of readings plus or 30 microns from your average. For me personally, I like to see readings above 100 microns to feel completely safe before starting paint correction. But like I mentioned, when you're just performing a light correction or enhancement, you don't need to be too concerned as you're just removing so little clear coat that it's just not a measurable amount. You'll also see that I measured the paint in the door jams. I do this because door jams usually have a bare minimum amount of clear coat applied. So usually the readings you get in the door jam areas will allow you to estimate how much clear coat thickness you have on the rest of the paint. In this case, I was getting an average of about 55 microns in the door jams. So if I minus that from the 125 microns I'm getting on the exterior paint, 
then that gives me a good 70 microns or so of actual clear coat on the car, which is a great healthy amount. Next was the pre-correction inspection. So with the car completely clean and under some proper defect spotting lights, this is really the only way to properly assess the paint and get a better understanding as to what it's going to take to achieve the desired result. I'm going to start by saying that I'm a fan of the new Ford Mustang. I think it looks, sounds and captures the essence of what a true muscle car should be. But I just can't overlook the fact that this and every other new Mustang that I've done over the past three years has been absolutely atrocious from a quality control and finish perspective. Now light swirls here and there are nothing I'm too concerned about and I'm fine with the odd moderate scratch or defect here and there as it's just normal and no new car is perfect. But as I dived into a closer, more thorough look, there was literally dozens and dozens of deeper to moderate scratches and defects all over the car. Now I'm not sure how well you guys will see it on camera, but this shard of black plastic that's fused into the base colour of the paint has been clear coated over and sealed into the boot lid. I mean, how does anyone inspect this car prior to sale and not see that or rectify it? They either don't care or their quality control is so bad that something so obvious can be missed. In any case, it's just not even close to being acceptable. And basically, if I pick that plastic off, it's going to take the clear and base coat off, leaving a nice little crater of bare metal in its place. Now, I actually spoke to the owner about it and recommended that he gets Ford to fix it, as well as a couple of other little paint chips on two other panels. As if no one speaks up, Ford's not going to change anything and this poor quality control will just continue. Apart from that, and as you'll hopefully see even further as I start the paint correction process, there were things like glue, tape and hard adhesive residue in multiple places around the trims, just so sloppily applied and not even cleaned up. And in almost every corner of every panel on the car where the panels and trims are fitted on, had at least moderate if not quite severe deeper scratches that really tells a story about how abruptly and how such a lack of professionalism and care this car was assembled with. Now, if I had my heart set on buying a new Ford Mustang, would this stop me? Honestly, probably not. But that just doesn't make it okay to tarnish the owner's new car experience. And it doesn't instill a lot of faith that you've made a good choice with your hard earned money. And don't even get me started on the black alloy rims that were just so scratched up it almost looks as if they were washed with a scotch bright pad. I'm not purposely trying to bag Ford or the Mustang, I just want Ford to do better in addressing these issues and based on detailing many other brand new Fords I know they can do it and I just don't understand why the new Ford Mustang which is one of their most desirable cars is so poorly delivered to its customers. So with all the decontamination and inspection stages completed, it was time to mask up the plastic and rubber trims to protect them and your pads during the paint correction stage. Masking is one of those things that isn't all that hard, but it does take a bit of practice to get good and quick at it. And having a few different thickness size tapes also really helps a lot. Basically, you want to be very precise with the edge and use as little breaks in the tape as possible as that's where it tends to lift up while you're polishing. So just take your time at first, and if you stuff it up, just remove it and start again. And be sure to run your fingers along the tape and firmly press it down after you apply it to make sure it stays in place when you're polishing.
So onto the paint correction stage to discover what it's going to take to get this paint looking its best. I'm going to be using the Ribes Miller Gear Driven DA Polisher and I'm going to be starting the first test section with a very mild combination in the form of the Lake Country Orange HDO Foam Pad and NV Finesse Polish. As far as technique goes, I'm going to apply 4-5 to five small drops of polish to a fresh pad. I'm going to start on speed 4 on the machine. I'm going to use a slow to moderate arm speed and just light pressure working a slightly larger area than normal. Basically, this is how I approach a new car when doing an enhancement polish, which is all about removing just mild defects and more so focusing on amplifying the gloss and clarity levels. So all in all, this is a very mild combination of products matched to a very non-aggressive technique. Now there are more severe defects scattered throughout the car where I'm going to have to address them in more of a spot correction process that you'll see later on. But for the majority of the car, it just has very light swirls and just a lack of clarity. That's what my focus is right now, trying to work out the best combination and technique for this specific paint. After every set of passes, I'm going to blow my pad out with compressed air, but you could just use a brush instead. I'll then gently wipe the majority of the polish residue with my first cloth, and then give the panel an IPA wipe with my second cloth to remove any polishing oils that may mask the true results by filling in minor defects. I'll then remove the masking tape, as it's going to allow me to judge my results far better and make the best possible decision based on what I'm seeing. Now metallic paints are really hard to capture cleanly on camera as they just tend to blow out in the footage, but I'll do my best to talk you through what I was seeing in person. When I'm assessing my results, there are two things I'm always looking for, which is firstly defect removal and secondly gloss and clarity. In this instance, I'd say that I've removed about 50% of the existing minor defects. And I'd also say that I've improved the gloss and clarity levels as the metallic flakes also look a little richer, which is a great sign. So what does this mean moving forward, which is always the most important question you should ask yourself after a test section. It means that if I want a better outcome, closer to 100% defect removal, and perhaps even better gloss levels, I'm going to need a slightly more aggressive approach. Additionally, it also suggests that this isn't an overly soft paint, as if it was, then those minor defects should have really been removed. But beyond that, I'll need to do some more testing to discover more. For a second test section, I stuck with NV Finesse Polish, as I already know it can finish well on this paint. But I stepped up to a slightly more aggressive pad in the form of the Lake Country Blue HDO pad to see if I could get a little more cut out of this polish but still retain its great finishing ability. Additionally, I also slightly increased my machine speed, added a touch more moderate pressure, and slowed my arm speed a little in an effort to focus my technique on achieving a little more cut or defect removal. Now having a look at the results in this second test section, 
the defect removal is much better and actually a good 95% plus, which is ultimately my goal. However, although the finish is still actually quite good and better than the unpolished paint, there is a very slight haze I'm seeing in this second test section that I'm just not seeing in my first test section. So basically what this means is that this pad and technique is perfectly removing all the minor defects, but it's just not finishing quite as good as I'd personally like. So at this stage, what it tells me is that the paint isn't overly soft, but it's also not overly hard, as I know that the blue HDO pad can finish perfectly on harder paints. So knowing that this orange pad can finish perfectly on this paint, and that I still need a little bit more cut, I stepped up to using it with Shell Concepts S20 Black to see if this combination would give me both the cut and finish I was looking for and my technique was identical to the previous test section. Now having a look at the results in this third test section, I just couldn't be more happy with the outcome. The minor defects have pretty much been removed, and the gloss and clarity levels are really fantastic, and so much better than the unpolished paint. So it's definitely a winning combination on this paint and its defects. So with all that sorted out, the next step was seeing if I could use this same combination to address some of the more obvious moderate to deeper scratches in a spot correction process. Now, Lake Country doesn't make smaller one or two inch sizes of the HDO pads, but the Ripper's yellow foam pad is actually very close, and I'm also gonna use it with the Ripper's TA50 polisher. Now, being that pretty much all deeper scratches on this Mustang are around panel edges, it's important to try and use smaller pads and machines to address them. As if you run a large polisher in an aggressive manner over panel edges, you'll firstly remove more clear coat than is necessary in those sensitive areas, and you'll secondly find it much harder to remove the actual scratches themselves, as it's difficult to get larger pads to correct the paint in such intricate areas. And as you'll see later on, I actually had to switch to using more aggressive pads and compounds to remove some of the deeper scratches using this same spot correction process. And then I had to do a second stage of polishing to refine the finish. But in the end, it did work out well, though it was quite time consuming, given that I had to address close to two dozen isolated scratches throughout the vehicle. Now in most cases, when I'm doing a new car enhancement polish, I'm actually going to use my larger polishers to do about 80% or so of the car as it's absolutely fine to use them on panel edges and body lines when it's just a light enhancement combination and you're just removing minor defects. However, the closer I got to each panel and section on this car, the more defects I could see around those intricate areas. So in the end, I had to tackle this car in more of a light correction manner rather than a quicker paint enhancement polish that I usually do on a brand new car. So around most of the panel edges and body lines, I did end up using my smaller three and two inch polishers. And I also used both of them to show you guys that you could really use either one and you don't necessarily need both as they can each do the job. And after I completed all my edge work using those smaller polishers, I then went back to my larger five inch polisher to finish up all the flat work on the bonnet. And that's pretty much the way I like to work on almost every paint correction job I do. Not every job has to be extremely time-consuming, high-end work, and I realise that not everyone has the time, budget, resources, or clients willing to pay for this level of work. But once you understand what's involved in high-end correction work, 
and what it really takes to achieve that. You can then make your own choice as to when and when not to pursue it. Now once again, I know it may be hard to clearly see the results in the footage, but after spending a good hour and a half to two hours just on the bonnet, it really looked fantastic, taking on a much warmer and richer tone in the metallic flakes and almost coming out a shade darker and more saturated than it originally was. So all in all, I'd say I was extremely pleased with the result in the end. Moving on to the roof, the first problematic area was the aerial that had a hard glue residue stain around it, as well as a nice amount of scratches mixed in, basically due to some sloppy work installing it at Ford. Now I did actually try using some adhesive remover to clean it up, but it just wasn't coming off. So in the end, I really had to use an abrasive polish to lift off the residue. Now being that I really had to get in close and precise to that aerial in order to get off that residue, I ended up using my one inch pad and polisher with my rotary attachment on my Rupes hybrid polisher. And once I had the majority of it off, I then followed up with my two inch pad and dual action polisher 
to clean up the rotary marks and also correct the paint around the rest of that area. This actually became quite a bit of extra unexpected work as I actually ended up going back to it again at a later stage to even refine the finish a little more. But in the end, I was able to get it almost perfect and you'd never even know what a sloppy job the factory did in installing the aerial. The rest of the riff was more or less completed in the same fashion as the bonnet using my mini polishers for the edge work and my larger polisher for all the flat work. Next, I just want to quickly touch on glass. Now, as I mentioned in part one, the owner of this car hasn't opted for a glass coating, but I usually try to give the glass a polish regardless, as sometimes if time and cost is on my side, I may try to give my clients a complimentary polish and glass coating. In any case, if you are intending on ceramic coating the glass, you really should give it a polish beforehand, as in my experience, it will allow the coating to last almost twice as long and just perform far better. Now glass is a very forgiving material to polish as it's just so hard and it's almost impossible to create haze on glass unless you're using an extremely aggressive product and method. So what I normally do is just use the exact same combination I'm using on the paint to also polish the glass. But what you're really doing here is giving the glass a nice thorough deep clean in preparation for a coating so that it will bond, last and perform so much better.
Now, as you guys continue to have a look at the footage, I'm just going to touch on a couple of points and try to address some potential questions you may have. Firstly, let's talk a little about hand polishing. Can you do this by hand? The answer is yes. However, there's a but, and it's a big one at that. Polishing a vehicle is nothing like waxing it. You really have to work that polish in or else your results are simply going to be poor. And it's just an extraordinarily large amount of work to do by hand over an entire vehicle. Now I know that for someone that has never used a machine polisher, it can be a scary experience as no one wants to ruin their car's paint. But if you can get over that hurdle, you will find that a free spinning dual action polisher, when used with finer polishes and non-aggressive pads such as this, is so much easier, just as safe, and gives you much better results in one tenth of the time compared to doing it by hand. I'll also add that a machine polisher is probably the cheapest detailing investment you'll ever make, as most of my polishers have been good for upwards of 2000 hours of work. So for a non-professional, it'll probably last you forever. While you'll spend 10 times more money on chemicals, compounds, pads, and other detailing products within that same time frame. Secondly, I'm getting this question multiple times a week, which is, I've got such and such car, so which compound and polish should I use? You know I love you guys, and I always do my best to reply to each and every person. But if I or anyone else had the answer to that question, there'd just be a list of cars and which compounds and pads to use on them. It just doesn't work that way, which is the whole reason I do these videos, to try and show you the process involved in how to discover that for yourselves, as doing a few test sections is really the only way anyone can truly answer that question. And I understand that you're just looking for advice as to what you should buy, because the options are just way too overwhelming. But what I can say is that I've used many compounds and pads for many different detailing brands in the past and I was able to get good results with each and every one of them. So it's not like there's one single magical brand out there that you have to have. Just choose a few different grades of compounds and pads that appeal to you for whatever reason, and then it's just a matter of adapting your technique a little to make them work best in your particular situation. Next, I want to talk a little about correcting plastic trims. Now, generally speaking, if the trim has a gloss finish on it, it can be successfully polished. But you should avoid polishing trims with matte or satin finishes, as you will create shine and alter their finish. These piano plastic trims are universally soft and extremely scratch prone, to the point that it doesn't really matter how safely you wash your car, as they will just inevitably get scratched up. As such, you really need to approach them as you would a super soft and sensitive paint. So for these trims, I switched back to my finer finishing polish, 
and also used a slightly less aggressive technique to correct them which worked extremely well. As for trims like head and tail lights, they are also clear coated, but the clear coat can be soft, medium or hard, so it really depends. But in this case, it did turn out to be a softer clear coat on the lights, so I also used the same less aggressive combination to correct them. I think halfway through editing this second video in this series, I realized that it's not going to be a general guide to detailing and preparing a new car for a coating and it's really going to be more of a guide as to how I do it personally and even more specifically how I did it on this particular car. Detailing is something almost anyone can do but no two people do it the same and no two cars or jobs are ever the same which makes it really hard to make a general guide as there's just so many variables to consider that change the way each individual car needs to be addressed. So the best I can do and what I hope I was able to communicate is that you need to inspect and assess both the vehicle and your results and that's the only way you can discover what you should use, what you should do and how you should do it. I've said this many times in past videos that the easiest part of detailing is using products, equipment and even machine polishes. It just takes a bit of practice. But if you want to become really good at it, and achieve those high-end level results consistently, you have to become really good at reading your results and knowing how to respond to them. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that you just can't learn how to detail one car with its specific paint, trims, condition and restrictions, and then just assume you can use those exact same products and methods to detail every other car that follows. But I hope this channel is starting to accumulate a diverse body of content and work that as a whole can help many of you out or at least point you in the right direction so that you can discover for yourselves how to address each specific vehicle. I hope you guys stay tuned for the third and final chapter in this series where I'll be ceramic coating the paint, showing you the finished results and summing up this whole job. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please share this video, like, comment and subscribe to this channel to show your support for this content and I'll see you guys soon.